So one of the most important roles that proteins have in the body is that they act as enzymes. And enzymes, as you've probably heard of before, are catalysts. They are biological catalysts. So they speed up reaction rates in the body, um, and they can speed reaction rates up millions and millions of times faster than they would naturally undergo. And uh, without them, life as we know it would really not be possible because the chemical reactions that, that run all of your cells, which run you, uh, which run other animals, um, simply wouldn't take place fast enough for life to exist. So enzymes are globular proteins, and they speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy of those reactions. Let's add that. Um, an enzyme's three-dimensional shape is incredibly essential to its function. Um, sometimes enzymes require uh, additional molecules that might be called cofactors or coenzymes. Um, things like vitamins are often precursors for uh, specific coenzymes. So that's why they're so essential in the diet because uh, you have to consume them. They may be modified slightly, and then they can interact and sort of activate the enzymes to work properly. Metal ions, um, so some minerals, can also act as inorganic cofactors uh, for enzymes. So in the pages to come, uh, just to clarify something, I'm going to um, mainly be focusing on cal catabolic processes just because they're sort of the simplest to explain, um, these breakdown processes that are, that are catalyzed by enzymes. But uh, just to be aware that there are also uh, countless enzymes that work for anabolic processes, such as DNA replication and protein synthesis. So enzymes work for both the breakdown and the buildup reactions, but uh, the next couple of pages will really just focus uh, on using catabolic examples. So a couple of uh, little vocab terms here. The, in an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, the reactant is going to be called the substrate, um, and the substrate and the enzyme interact uh, with intermolecular forces at a place called the active site. So usually you have this very complicated tertiary globular structure, so sort of a somewhat spherical uh, protein shape, lots and lots of folding, and somewhere in sort of a nook um, in, the, uh, in the protein, in the enzyme, um, is gonna be a, a spot that fits very well with this substrate. Um, and they're going to attract through intermolecular forces um, and create a, a big complex that's known as the enzyme substrate complex. And so that's when the uh, enzyme and the substrate are temporarily uh, bound together through a variety of interactions. So the types of interactions that exist between an enzyme and a substrate are really important to know. Um, again, these are not permanent. They're, they're temporary interactions. And so in this chapter, you should associate temporary, meaning non-covalent. Um, so things like hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole forces, and London forces. So those are the IMFs that could uh, be holding a substrate next to uh, an enzyme's active site, but also ionic bonds um, between R groups that might have picked up a charge. So there's lots and lots of different types of interactions that can hold a substrate to uh, an enzyme's active site, but uh, not covalent bonds, because if that happens, um, then the uh, substrate would never leave because it's now sort of permanently attached to the enzyme. So that's going to that's gonna, uh, happen later for the HL class with something called inhibitors. Um, the theory about how enzymes and substrates interact and how they work uh, is called the induced fit mechanism. Um, the idea is that the substrate and the active site fit together uh, quite well, um, and, they, and they, they not only fit together, but at, at that active site, um, the amino acids sort of line up well to create um, lar uh, a fairly large amount of attraction between the active site um, and the substrate. So those hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, et cetera. And as they get closer and closer together, the, um, the enzyme's shape actually uh, is changed a little bit so that it more tightly fits with the substrate. So you can see from uh, this picture to the next picture, um, we're sort of, well, really actually from the first picture, sorry, to the second picture, you can see that the enzyme has this shape originally, and then it sort of um, more closely folds around the substrate. So uh, that's the idea of this induced fit. It's not that it's a perfect fit to begin with, but as they interact and more and more of these intermolecular forces start to take place, uh, the substrate and the enzyme <clears throat> really temporarily bind together and sort of pull each other's shapes 
uh, together so that they they uh, match really really well. Okay, so how does how does that help us getting towards uh, getting towards a reaction to take place? Well, the the theory to continue it is once you've got this complex together, as you bind the substrate to the enzyme, it puts strain on other bonds within the substrate, and so eventually it causes uh, other bonds in the substrate molecule to break and possibly uh, also reform or form new bonds in that substrate. So as it's binding on more strongly to the enzyme itself uh, with all those different IMFs, it's, uh, it's causing other interactions within the substrate to break apart and change. And so as it does that, it forms products. And when the products are formed, then they actually don't fit any longer uh, with the active site. So a key thing is that as it's changing into a product, it's going to change something about the shape or IMFs of the substrate. And so then it's naturally going to get uh, released from the enzyme back into the surroundings. So you have a substrate um, that attracts through a variety of attractions to the enzyme uh, that induces a more tight, uh, closer fit and attraction between the two. At that point, you have the enzyme, enzyme substrate complex. Uh, those interactions cause strain within the substrate, which eventually causes bonds to break in the substrate. Um, and eventually that causes the substrate to form into something new. Um, so bonds are broken, bonds are formed, and you form what you call the products. So now you have the enzyme product complex. Uh, the products no longer attract and fit perfectly well with the active site. So they, get, they naturally get released, which frees the enzyme up to, uh, to start over again and to work on a new substrate. So the enzyme is not used up by the reaction, which is why it's a catalyst. You, you still have it afterwards. Um, and you can summarize the process as enzyme plus substrate turns into the M enzyme substrate complex. They're now sort of bound together, which converts to enzyme bound to product. And then the products leave uh, the enzyme. And so uh, the theory about how enzymes and substrates interact um, has developed over time from a more basic lock and key model to now the induced fit model. And as computer modeling gets stronger and stronger, uh, it continues to develop and will probably get more advanced uh, in the coming years. So enzymes speed up chemical reactions. So kinetics is that is topic six and 16, what we talked about with reaction rates. So when we talk about how an enzyme affects a reaction rate, we're gonna talk about enzyme kinetics. And all enzymes produce a graph uh, of rate of reaction against substrate concentration that looks something like this. Um, so it, as substrate concentration increases, uh, the rate of reaction increases, but then uh, it stops increasing so much and it eventually plateaus, meaning that for a given amount of enzyme, um, eventually you can't make the re rate of reaction go any faster. And so how can we explain this? with reference to the induced fit mechanism? Well, there's a key term that essentially is, uh, well, it's a pretty simple term, term saturation. There's a saturation point. Um, if you keep on putting more and more substrate around enzymes, eventually all of the enzymes are working on substrate uh, uh, already. And if you add any more substrate, it can't make the reaction go any faster because the enzymes are already completely occupied completely saturated with substrate. So there's a saturation um, of substrate at a certain point and beyond which um, increasing the substrate concentration has no effect on the rate. So initially it's a, any sort of collision theory would explain that increasing concentration allows for more frequent collisions with the enzymes and that's gonna make reaction rates go a lot faster. But it, it, it begins to have less of an effect and eventually has no effect because you get saturation um, of the enzyme with substrate. And so they're incredibly uh, enzymes, again, as I, I'll keep mentioning, they're incredibly complex. Their tertiary structures uh, are essential, especially the tertiary structure of the active site. And so um, all those different attractions that are involved, all the IMFs, the ionic bonds, um, if anything affects that, um, that's going to uh, that's going to change how well the enzyme can function and how well it can speed up a reaction rate. So enzymes are going to respond to changes in their environment a little bit more sensitively than 
an inorganic catalyst like uh, iron metal or sulfuric acid because they are so large and complex and they depend on so many you know hundreds and thousands of little interactions to keep their structure in the right shape that if you change factors such as temperature ph or uh, the presence of heavy metal ions you're gonna uh, you can drastically influence how well an enzyme actually can work so uh, one key factor that we know affects the reaction rate is temperature uh, and under collision theory we would say that uh, temperature, well, you should pause the video and see if you can come up with the two reasons. So reason number one uh, is that it increases the frequency of collisions or collision, number of collisions per unit time um, because particles have more kinetic energy slash more speed. So that one's pretty easy. Uh, the other one is it increases the number of particles with kinetic energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. Um, so we know that temperature can speed up reactions for both these reasons, and reason number two is considered to be the more important reason. But uh, that's going to hold true for enzymes as well to a point. Um, but because enzymes are these long chains that are and their shape is held together by you know, IMFs that are not incredibly strong, um, if you increase their kinetic energy too much and the, the chain starts to vibrate and wiggle too much, um, those IMF interactions can be broken by the fact that the temperature is too high. So um, increasing kinetic energy can lead to the breaking of IMFs and interactions in the tertiary structure. And this is known as uh, denaturing an enzyme if you, if you uh, change its tertiary structure. So every enzyme is going to have an optimum temperature at which it operates with its maximum reaction rate. And above that temperature, the rate actually drastically drops off. So uh, it's going to look different than our... Normally, you would think as temperature goes up, the rate of reaction should just keep going up. But actually, what you see is that uh, as temperature goes up, the rate goes up for a time. And then after you hit this peak temperature, then we get a pretty steep drop off back down to, you know, essentially no activity. And so whatever this temperature is that, that gives us that maximum reaction rate, that is the optimum temperature. But beyond that temperature, it is too hot. There's too much motion, too much kinetic energy and there's going to end up being a loss of the tertiary structure, and that stops the enzyme from functioning properly. So this is usually irreversible, um, but uh, it, it, yeah, it, and it pretty much just destroys the enzyme from working anymore because its shape has been changed. Um, it doesn't mean that the enzyme breaks apart into all of its amino acids. The primary structure uh, could very well stay intact, but that doesn't mean that the protein can work anymore because you changed that all-important active site. And so the most common example that you'd be aware of in everyday life is if you cook an egg, um, the egg white is almost entirely protein and heating it um, is what causes it to turn white. Um, and that is not really a reversible process. Um, and it's taking that protein and it's uh, causing all the chains to wiggle and break apart and uh, totally changes the shape of the protein inside of an egg white. This is different than digestion, which would be the hydrolysis of all those peptide bonds. So actually breaking up the peptide bonds into individual amino acids. So it's not really related to the temperature topic, it's just to, to point it out for distinction. Um, deactivation is a different term, and that refers to uh, if you actually, you can deactivate an enzyme if you get it cold enough that it, it just can't really work anymore. So putting things like in a freezer sort of deactivates a lot of the enzymes that cause the food to break down and, and go bad. Um, and if you warm it back up, then those enzymes can still work. But once you've denatured an enzyme by making it too hot, that's sort of an irreversible change to the tertiary structure. So the implications for organisms is that you have to keep, uh, an organism has to keep its body temperature within a fairly narrow range of temperatures, or else there's lots of enzymes that will no longer function properly. Um, that's why it's so dangerous when people get really, really high fevers. Um, because if, if their body temperature is too hot, it can mean that a bunch of the enzymes uh, aren't going to work anymore, and that can lead to 
serious health problems and, and possibly even death. Okay, pH, fairly similar concept. Um, we know that decreasing pH, what's that going to do to amino acids? Hopefully by now you associate decreasing pH with H plus and therefore uh, positive charges. So if there are lots of uh, H plus ions around, um, the term for what's going to happen to all those amino acids is that they're going to get protonated. So that just means that um, lots of hydrogen ions will bind to the protein um, or to the amino acids. And if you can imagine binding up a bunch of H plus charges to the uh, to the structure is going to really change. Uh, it's going to change the overall charge, um, and that's going to lead to changes in those uh, all important interactions that keep the shape. It changes the charge and changes um, tertiary interactions. So if you uh, change the pH enough, you can definitely damage uh, the protein's tertiary structure and change it. Um, as far as uh, increasing the pH, we know that that's going to be associated with uh, OH minus. And so lots of hydroxide ions will bind to the protein or if they don't bind to the protein, they will remove uh, H plus ions from the protein. Either way, that's also going to lead to uh, a change in charge, and that could change the tertiary interactions as well. So what's going to happen to these complex tertiary structures? Well, pretty much if you're not at the one um, very close to this optimum pH value that you're designed to work at, then the enzyme is not going to work properly. So Every enzyme has a very narrow range of pH around which it uh, functions very poorly if it's not at that pH range. So the optimum pH would be in my little diagram here, uh, somewhere around here. <clears throat> and that optimum pH is different for different enzymes. Uh, obviously, enzymes that work in your blood, enzymes that work in your mouth, enzymes that work in your stomach um, have different pH values at which they function uh, the best at. Um, so an optimum pH can, can have a lot of difference for different enzymes. Um, and it can be quite useful because, uh, like, for example, pepsin is an enzyme that works in your stomach to break pepti peptide bonds. Um, and it works well in that low pH environment. But if it makes it out of the stomach into the intestine, which has a higher pH, uh, it gets deactivated and it stops working because the, the OH minus ions that are there change the tertiary structure of pepsin and make it so it can't function anymore. So that's useful because you only want certain enzymes to work in certain uh, environments. And usually um, the optimum pH is, is fairly similar to the pKa values of the amino acids uh, that are present at the active site. So just a little comment there for the HL group, uh, group that knows about pKa values. Um, but just remember there's going to be a very narrow pH range where things work. Lower, lower pHs are going to cause protonation, the reaction of the enzyme amino acids with hydrogen ions, and high pH will cause reactions with hydroxide ions, uh, both of which will change the overall charge of the protein and will change its tertiary structure. Uh, similar things to denaturation uh, and implications for health. So I um, already talked about that with the temperature. Um, the only additional comment here is that this is the reason why buffers are so important inside the body. Um, such as the bicarbonate um, carbonic acid system in the blood. Uh, your body has lots of different buffers in it, which help maintain the pH of that environment so that the enzymes can continue to work. And lastly, uh, heavy metal ions, um, lead, copper ions, mercury, silver ions, for example. Um, these are poisons because of the way that they bind with amino acids and therefore the way that they affect enzymes from working properly. So I know we, we think of these things as protein, uh, poisons, and so therefore they're just, they're just bad for you in some way. But actually, chemically, what's happening in many cases is that these things uh, react with enzymes and stop the enzymes from uh, carrying out their uh, life-important processes. So one amino acid in particular that tends to be affected is called cysteine. It's a rather unique amino acid because it has sulfur uh, as part of its structure, um, and that sulfur can actually form a dative covalent bond with metal ions. So if you have a lead ion that's in the presence of the cysteine, um, the lead ion will replace the H plus and kick the H plus off and form an essentially permanent uh, covalent bond with the sulfur atom. And that's going to, this, this big giant metal uh, ion 
is going to influence the shape of the of the enzyme, whether it does this right at the active site or at some other point on the on the enzyme. And obviously, if you change the shape of the enzyme, then that enzyme cannot carry out uh, its function anymore. So that's why metal ions end up being so disastrous for for health and why they act as poisons. They bind permanently to a lot of enzymes and change the shape so that the enzyme can't function anymore. So these are the tick boxes that we've covered in the video. Um, we've talked about the uh, in the previous video, we talked about levels of structure, um, talked about how enzymes act and uh, between the substrate and the active site, and, and enzyme activity depends on temperature, pH, and heavy metal ions. And I'll stop the video there.